I also want to thank uh, Christina for her support of special services. Uh, I see many familiar faces and many new ones. I know uh, it was some time ago, uh, BC, as my colleagues are calling it, before COVID, uh, where I had the chance to present to you in person. And perhaps the, the best part of the day was grabbing coffee and having those collegial chats on the side. I'm glad we can meet in this virtual format and I cannot wait like you to go back to a time when we can have those fulfilling face-to-face -face interactions. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll talk today um, a little bit about how COVID has impacted many processes in our lives, including the way we teach and help our students. All right, folks, so we're gonna talk about the storm we have all been in. Um, and uh, I have to admit, it recently has been feeling a bit like deja vu as well. And we're gonna talk about, as Mary Joseph pointed out, uh, how we can approach the storm through different ways. It's the natural response to be fatigued, to be um, despaired, to be pessimistic, to be tired at this point, this far into the pandemic. And also when we are facing chronic, chronic stress, there are those who sometimes can step up in that situation and uh, approach it with a different attitude or with a mindfulness of how they can do their best in that condition. In a sense, when there's a storm happening, we can't control the storm. We can take shelter, which is necessary sometimes and absolutely normal. Other times we can step out into that storm and see what we can bring to it to still have a positive impact, to still have a fulfilling life. Now, before we talk about the storm, let's situate the journey we've been on. Um, I, I won't go through the introduction of myself. Many of you know me, I'm a psychologist and I serve many of our schools in the east end of the city. I also supervise emerging professionals at York University and uh, see uh, many young adults at university settings outside of our school system. So let's talk about the deja vu we're facing. You know, it's, uh, uh, it, it is definitely an uh, uncanny feeling to be having this meeting over Zoom um, uh, after another round of closures. I know the uncertainty of this year has definitely given me a lot of feelings of deja vu, and especially with the, the, this, this wave and the, uh, the, the worry and the significance, the enormity of how many people are getting sick and different creates anxiety because is, there is a the direct threat to our health and anxiety is a natural response to threat. There is also a sense of return to uncertainty. We again don't know where this may be going. And uh, this in many ways may feel back like how things started. And I know both the news media and uh, many of our colleagues have been mentioning how uh, again we are feeling about, uh, we're feeling uncertain about our next step. We're not sure where as a system, where as individuals, how we're going to navigate um, the coming month. Um, and it has been difficult to begin with. I know on top of that, many of us are experiencing worries about our finances, about our health and well-being, about the health and well-being of the loved ones we have. Many of us are still processing grief from loss of loved ones, from loss of many things we used to enjoy in our life, the normalcy, from simple things to travel to the more profound, like being able to see our grandparents or relatives without worry, uh, from having family gatherings. I know for many of us, uh, Christmas this year was very muted. And this has been now two years into this process where we didn't expect it to go this long. I, I know I, I have the fault of being overly optimistic oftentimes, and I always thought that the last wave would be the final wave. And if you are like me, it can become increasingly despairing to see us back in a situation of uncertainty. How do we deal with this weight, the weight of these big emotions? Now, again, my optimistic side comes up often because there are reports from our uh, medical colleagues that um, this may prove to be uh, the last wave, knock on wood, and in many ways, our population is far more ready than we've ever been before. Vaccination rates are high. We are more prepared than we were before. So this is not the same as the start, even though it may feel like it. And uh, just yesterday, uh, Quebec and Ontario said that, uh, according to them, Omicron has peaked. So let's take a moment 
and go through the, the unexpected journey of uh, remote learning and teaching that we went through and that many of us, and, and especially you, my frontline teacher colleagues, adapted to so swiftly uh, and so beautifully. And this has been a journey that um, many of us weren't prepared for. I know I wasn't prepared for. I actually hadn't used Zoom at all uh, before the pandemic. And so there was a bit of a learning curve for many of us, and that learning curve had a cost associated to it, a cost when it came to our sense of competence, to our sense of ability as educators, as helpers. And it definitely added an element of stress to the tasks that we were carrying out on a day-to-day -day basis on top of dealing with the uncertainties of the world we were facing. So if you go back, and look at where the journey started. And this publication did a good job of looking at where, what has the cost been to this point and um, how have we navigated it? Um, if you look, go back to March, 2020, I know that may feel like a long time ago. Um, that's when we had some of the first closures. Um, even though we did return, uh, attempt to return gradually in the January, we again hit a, a full closure uh, April indefinitely. And we've had one recently. Um, so when we look at those closures, uh, the impact across the board has been, aside from all of us having to adapt to remote learning, many of our students have been outside of the classroom. Uh, Ontario has had some of the longest school closures, both at the post-secondary, at the secondary, and at the elementary level across Canada. And there's research now emerging about what has the impact of this been. Aside from the closures, majority of our, many of our students have decided to engage in online learning. So for example, uh, the TDSP has provided stats that about 80,000 of their students have opted for online learning. That's a huge chunk of our students that are now voluntarily staying out of school, or at least the school environment, as we were accustomed to providing education to them. There's some emerging study about the impact of these uh, lapses in access to education and remote learning in general on the gaps uh, in students. And studies from end of last year were showing that roughly two to three months, there's a two to three months delay in the academic output of students. Um, uh, the best study we have in, in an Ontario setting is the standardized reading tests that were done by the TDSB. And what they found is that um, essentially reading levels within grade one students were uh, roughly six to 9% lower on those tests than they expected. That's almost a standard deviation. That is a significant drop. And now, even though we're still disrupted by COVID, we're beginning to face having to help students who are struggling, who may be disengaged because of those struggles. And also we can see that this demand will continue. That there are many students who are going to be needing help moving forward. And so no wonder as educators, as support staff, we're feeling um, the weight of this uncertainty. Do we have what it takes to face this challenge? Because we do care for our students and to know the need that's coming up can sometimes feel daunting. Um, we also know that many, many students voluntarily, uh, parents uh, did not enroll students in kindergarten. So there has been also an epidemic of missing students across the boards. Of course, they're not missing, uh, our projections were that they would be enrolled and they haven't been enrolled. And so we know those students will also have gaps as they enter grade one, hopefully when the parents feel safer to let them engage in formal schooling. There've been many publications recently starting to look at the impact this had on the broad system and we'll narrow more on the impact it's had on teachers um, because we felt that first line. Um, I, the, the most uh, comprehensive study so far, looking at the impact of remote education, not even the gaps, well, has been out of Netherlands, where there has been really robust access to internet for those students. And despite that, there was a lot of delay, especially in students who were coming from uh, marginalized communities or had less resources and less availability of parental time to invest in co-education with them. And that brings up strong issues of equity. Um, and we feel those on the front lines. So uh, one way of looking at this that uh, some of our colleagues have pointed out, and there's a publication, and it's called the displacement effect. And that's the huge disconnection we feel when we are interacting with people through a, a virtual format. And again, I mentioned that the morning coffee at the, the, the beautiful Japanese cultural center where we often have these pastoral days of care, where we get to chit chat with our colleagues, where we can have those informal conversations at the water cooler. And 
although I am delighted to see your beautiful faces here right now, it's not the same. And that has been feeling like that for a long time when we had been doing remote education. And for many of us who are still doing much of our work remotely, including servicing students who have decided to stay remote. And although we know the impact this has on youth, and we'll talk about in a moment, let's focus on the impact this has on educators and teachers. Being disconnected from the people we serve has many ramifications. And uh, I, I like this poignant picture of a very dedicated teacher who's sitting and you know, teaching virtually in his empty classroom. And this, this picture often reminds me the toll this has had on teachers where they're stepping up doing the best they can, yet oftentimes because of this disconnection, we don't feel the effect of our actions as much as we would in person, those moments of connection that we would have with our students. So here are some stories from our colleagues. Uh, one colleague pointed out that the lack of preparedness and training for the online transition and this is especially true during that first year, um, heightened stress because suddenly, uh, you know, we went from having to be teachers, educators, supporters, mentors, uh, guidance providers to also tech support people. And uh, that was a rough transition for many of us who like myself had never used Zoom, for example, or who weren't comfortable preparing their lecture material and their educational material online, because again, that support was lacking at the beginning. Understandably so, we were all improvising. At the same time, there was a continuing sense among many of my colleagues that we continued improvising. And I know even now, sometimes it may feel like that. And that adds to our sense of uncertainty and anxiety. Uh, Doreen, uh, who took a leave of absence in, in September, said from her favorite job in the world, uh, because of the challenge with online learning, said uh, she didn't feel like the government understood the needs that she had and she hadn't received the training she needed. Um, other colleagues said that uh, an online school day takes twice to three times to plan that, that of a regular school day. We're online up to 10 hours a day, including Saturdays. At the end of the day, I feel completely exhausted, Le Moan said. And these are sentiments I've heard from many of my colleagues as I've been checking with them, checking about their mental health um, over the last two years. And I think it's okay to give voice to this, to give voice to the fact that we navigated a storm and we navigated as best as we could have. And as part of that, we improvised and we did the best we could as a system and as individuals. And that took a toll because it meant that we were wading in uncertainty and not knowing whether the next challenge we will have the support resources or the knowledge we need to navigate it. And I want to say kudos to all the frontline educators because we did navigate it and we can see, it, see the impact on our students as they return to school. Where we find that they are thrilled to be back in person and also that they are um, still engaged with their school education. Now the displacement effect happens when we have an increased amount of time looking at a screen at the expense of basic psychological needs, which is human connection, empathy, nonverbal communication, touch, being able to share spontaneous conversations. So many of the water cooler or rather the coffee conversations we have with colleagues are not planned in advance. They happen spontaneously and they enrich our day. They add a little bit of spice to the monotony sometimes of the days. And so it is not surprising that there has been uh, an epidemic of teacher burnout, as many of researchers and publications are calling it. Um, and uh, there are different reasons att attributed. I'm not a sociologist or a policy analyst, so I don't know what the main reason is, but I do know that this plays a central role. The fact that the fulfillment that many of us had from that in-person interaction has been reduced due to the displacement effect. One of our colleagues said, I've never said so many times that I want to quit in a year. When you're around the kids, it's hard to be apathetic. They're so full of life and there's, there's such a desire to connect with them. But when you're doing the work on your own, it's a bit like, what am I doing here? What difference does it make? And that question, what difference does it make? is an important one to address because when we feel our actions have no impact, we feel like we're automatons, like we are doing something that is stifling, that we are doing an action going through it without any apparent benefit to those around us. And that feels like suffering. Um, now, whether that assumption is true or not, does it make a difference, is one that we have to look into, because the research shows it does make a huge difference. Yet, because of the displacement effect, when we are interacting with others through a, a remote medium like Zoom, it is hard to see that without actively looking for it and checking in with the people we are interacting. 
So what does this burnout look like? And, and many of you may have experienced some of this. Um, if you're feeling like you're just clocking in and out, that while you're in the day, you can't wait for the day to be finished. Um, if you're feeling lethargic, exhausted, these are all signs of burnout. It could be a detachment or even cynical attitude towards our own work, being like, oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't make a difference. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just a puppet or a cog in the system. That feeling of lack of autonomy or lack of power or agency. And intense feelings of being ineffective. And as educators, support staff, and helpers, that's one that really hurts, that really hits deep. Because we want to help. Why else would we get into this challenging and you know, uh, very arduous profession? It's because we want to make an impact on the lives of others. And so when we feel ineffective at making that impact, it adds to the burden we carry, to the already existing exhaustion that we are dealing with from all the aspects of the pandemic that we've been navigating. And so there's a lot of concerns around teacher burnout and there is a lot of evidence that it is happening and it is something that we all have to be attuned to because this can happen to any of us. And uh, I think it also makes sense. This is the result of a two year global pandemic. This is not something that's happening because teachers are choosing, it's because we are dealing with something that's excruciatingly difficult and we haven't prepared for it in the past. We are all dealing with this as best as we can. So some publications also looked at another factor that many of us, I know especially my colleagues who I work with have felt deeply, um, and that is the inequity that remote learning has created. I know um, I've had distressed guidance counselors reach out to me, my distressed social colleague workers who, who are worried about students who are falling through the cracks, who've stopped showing up and we can't track them down, who have disengaged to the point of um, either logging sporadically on or not logging on at all. And these students, these lost students, cause us all grief and anxiety because we know already when they were in person, they may have had some challenges engaging and we had to work so hard to maintain that connection. And that connection was their life right. It was what kept them into the system. Now, remotely, sometimes we've lost touch of some of them. And so a research study looking at what teachers said in terms of um, what were some of the cause of their grief, their anxiety, their concern was palpably seeing this inequity, seeing parents who are working jobs, essential workers who can't be there to support their children as they are engaging in online learning, seeing parents who, because of uh, lack of familiarity with English or technology, aren't able to help their children access and the children themselves can't. And it's a term that's been widely used and it's called the digital divide. And the digital divide is real and it's something that we have all seen and felt as educators. Um, so according to an estimate by the uh, Ontario government, uh, roughly 12% of Ontarians didn't have proper access to internet to access remote learning. And before the pandemic, uh, two thirds of households didn't have sufficient devices for multiple students or student and adult to be accessing the internet. Um, this is problem and this is something that has happened and will continue to impact the students we serve as they return to school. We may see gaps widen and we may see disengagement increase. And that itself takes a toll on us as educators because we care. And that toll sometimes is referred to as compassion fatigue. And we'll talk about that. Here's a poignant story by a teacher that um, uh, really stood out to me. Some teachers at the school noticed that students would come to the school parking lot and use the building's Wi-Fi for their coursework because they didn't have access to it at home. And many students were relying on their internet cellular data to uh, cellular internet to, to access courses and resources, and that's not sufficient. So we have seen these disparities, these inequities, and it affects us when the students we care about and those who are marginalized, who are disadvantaged, are farther hurt and farther uh, coming out a short change through this pandemic. So what is compassion fatigue? We know burnout is a state of emotional and physical exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. Like the kind of stress we would face if there's an uncertain threat to your health and financial well-being and to the health of your family members for two years. That understandably could cause burnout. Compassion fatigue is also the added stress and burnout that comes from caring for others while curiously experiencing their pain because we are empathic beings. And from the desire to help and relieve their suffering and it can be heightened when that desire is timely, when the people we are trying so hard to reach, to support, to help, 
uh, we find ourselves being ineffective in doing so. And that has been heightened by the distance that remote learning has created, by the distance that remote access or this medium of digital access has created. Um, there's a wonderful quote uh, that Marie Jose once showed me, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. And I love that uh, quote because it shows us that we are all immersed in the struggles and the sufferings of those we support. And of course, we will be impacted by it, of course. So when we have the experience of compassion fatigue, it not only heightens burnout, but it can also make us even more uh, burdened by the cost of the pandemic and our roles. It can be, there can be a deep erosion to our ability to connect with others. We may seek isolation. There can be an immense sense of ineffectiveness or um, a, a disconnection from our professional identity. And one of the ways that can show up is a desire to quit, to leave, to change jobs, or the feeling of just punching in and punching out, just showing up till the day is over because you have to. Not be because you want to or not because there's any meaning that you're looking forward to during the day because it's an obligation. And when we get to the point where we are going through those motions, it can kind of feel like we're an automaton, we're a zombie, we're just a cog in a machine. And that feeling deeply, deeply causes suffering because agency is important to human beings. And when we feel like we are just going through the motions, that we are not acting based on our values, based on our desires, or based on things that give us meaning, then we feel despair. And that despair can quickly turn into suffering, to being jaded, and to burnout or depression. We also know that COVID has impacted the well-being of the students we support. Now, I will quickly go over this, but we, we, there's a lot more out there. For example, we know that increased uh, screen time is strongly associated, especially during the pandemic, to uh, depression and anxiety for school-aged children. And I often see it in the teenagers I work with in our school system, where because of the disengagement, they've also lost goals or motivation to engage in school. What's the point? Oftentimes we get our motivation from our social feedback. So I get motivated to do something when I feel praise, when I get some feedback from my peers, from teachers, from society as a large, that what I'm doing is valuable. So when I'm not getting that feedback, why should I do it? It's sometimes hard for teenagers to create that meaning and that purpose in themselves. They often get it from us as adults, praising them, encouraging them, cheerleading them. And that's been increasingly harder for them to access through remote learning and through the pandemic. Who's listening to Toronto Catholic District School? Um, there have also been a number of studies looking at uh, the wave of mental health needs that have been dramatically increasing over the subsequent waves with our students. And, uh, and this is an older study, now. this is the third wave that showed that up to 70% of students reported detriments, significant detriments to their mental health. So folks, what is the impact of screens on learning, both on us as teachers, educators, support staff, and on our students? Well, one of the challenges of screens is that it is like being hungry and being in a buffet. Our brains like novelty and stimulation. And being on a screen where you have access to your email, news, everything around you can be very tempting to multitask. In fact, if I were to do probably a straw poll right now, I would bet half of you have another screen open aside from this one. And that is just human nature. We crave stimulation. And when it's in front of us, it's hard to resist. Again, it's like going to the buffet hungry. It's really hard to sit there and not eat. So many of us engage in this, and so do our students, because they're even weaker at putting the brakes on their behavior, at that executive function, the impulse control. So many of them engage in excessive multitasking, and it impairs their learning and memory. We know multitasking is hugely detrimental to performance, to memory, to attention, and it affects us too as educators. As I was making this presentation last night, every five minutes I was checking the news or checking my email. Even though I know the research, I'm not immune to it either. And as many of us had to shift to creating our curriculums online or to providing education online, we were impacted by this rampant inability to stop multitasking as well. And that took a lot of energy. It exhausted us farther. Um, there's been tremendous research on this before the pandemic at how in-class multitasking, how laptops are learning, both at the post-secondary level and at the uh, secondary level. 
Uh, this was actually what I did my dissertation on. And one of the most effective time management strategies we found was helping students not to multitask, to essentially help them uh, block distractions. Um, I, I know this because for many years, aside from being a professor at Seneca College, I was also a teaching assistant at, at many uh, classes at York University. So I would often go in the back of the class and I would see university students rampantly multitask. And our high schoolers are not immune to this. In fact, they're more prone to doing it because they do not know the harms of multitasking. In fact, when most students are queried about this, they falsely believe they are capable of multitasking. In fact, they claim it has zero impact on their behavior and learning. That's because we often do not know the harms multitasking does to us because we have a sense of I'm there, I'm participating, I'm present. Um, but what we don't know is that it significantly impacts how much of the information we process and how much of it we remember. And it's not just with computers. When kids are at home, they are surrounded by all the devices that can demand their attention. And it's a demand, it's not even a temptation at this point when it comes to phones. We know this because if a child, heck, even an adult like myself, if I leave my phone home, I have so much anxiety, I will go back to find it, right? At this point, the phones have become an extension of ourselves and we feel extreme anxiety when they're not around us. That level of dependence may have been ludicrous 10 years ago, um, and now it's a fact of life. And it's one where I've come to accept it. You know, I don't try to separate uh, my, you know, the teens I work with from their phones. I try to help them manage it, to understand that it has harms. And I understand that they can't be on it, uh, uh, that they can't put it away. How can we balance their use with it? You know, there's a lot of research and many, much of it is pre-pandemic that we rampantly use our phones. We check it incessantly. Uh, many of us check it up to two to 300 times a day. I know uh, last time when I spoke to a group of educators, I asked them to install an app on their phone to see how often they check it, their phone. And even they were surprised with the frequency that we bring up our phone just to check it. And each of those is a disruption to our attention. And especially to our sleep, especially the teenagers' sleep. So the study, again, this is pre-pandemic, and it's gotten worse during the pandemic. We found that um, teenagers often text and take their phone uh, to bed with them. And that's hugely disrupts their sleep. And we have had also a pandemic of sleep disruption when the kids were staying at home and they didn't have the structure that would normally maintain their circadian rhythm. So it, it is not uncommon for me to work with teens who are experiencing insomnia. And they're experiencing insomnia both because of heightened anxiety, but also because of bad sleep hygiene. And in fact, that's been primarily one of the issues I've been working on with teens uh, that, that I see across the board. And this is not just by chance. The, the devices we use are designed to be addictive. They're, they're, uh, they're designed under the principles of gamification. Essentially, they have teams of psychologists saying, how can we make this as addictive as possible? And they use many of the principles when we use beneficially in our classrooms, like reinforcement schedules, visual charts. Um, they have streaks on apps where if you stop using it, you lose your investment. So teens are invested to, the more they use it, the more they feel compelled to use it. And of course, the brain chemistry behind is very evident. We get a kick up reward when we get notifications and calls from our friends. And so this can become addictive over time, just that signal of notification, like Pavlov's dog, we respond to it. The moment we see the light flashing, we have a surge of anxiety and excitement. We have to check the phone. Um, there's even some, not so, uh, I would say, ethical studies done by these social media giants. So, for example, there was a leaked document some years ago where Facebook was offering to sell to advertisers um, when teenagers were experiencing worthlessness and insecurity. So they would flag them based on their post that, oh, this person is experiencing worthlessness and insecurity, so that advertisers would sell specific products to them based on that emotion. And emotion-based advertising has continued. They got a lot of flack for this. But this is something that's now part of the social media experience of many teens. And we often see it, for example, on Instagram, where uh, even a small amount of use by young people uh, results in negative body image. And the impact it has on the body image is hugely detrimental. So let's put, put the impact on our teens aside. We, we know much of this already. But let's recognize now, teens were at home distracted, and so were we. We are at home and we are surrounded by these distractions. We are dealing with uncertainty. And we're also trying to be there for these students that we care about and feeling sometimes ineffective and sometimes unprepared because we hadn't prepared for this transition to online learning. At least I had it. 
Now, some of the tools that they often get students to use is to learn to structure their digital environment that would be structured physical environment. So if you're studying, it's a good idea to put your phone in your bag or at least out of sight. We can also teach students to manage their digital environment and us ourselves as adults, we can learn to do that. For example, having a separate device or a separate account on the device for work versus leisure, um, uh, using different environments for work versus leisure, doing work in one setting, make you watching Netflix in another setting because that creates different associations. I often get students to install web blockers. Web blockers are uh, applications that based on your own choice, block your access to social media or distracting sites so that you don't have to use your willpower constantly to stay off them. So oftentimes when I'm writing a report or when I'm preparing a presentation, I have web blockers block YouTube for me because that's where I often go to escape the distress that uh, work gives us. This is often the case with our teenagers because Cognitive effort, especially dealing with assignments that we don't know how to approach, causes a bit of anxiety, distress. And it's important for us to surf that wave of anxiety in order to be able to start working. When we have easy escapes, such as Netflix, YouTube, ways of zoning out, what often happens with our teenagers is that they start to engage with their academic work and then they zone out. And that results in them not learning the ability to withstand distress, something called distress tolerance, and to give up easily on tasks that maybe with effort they would have been able to manage. And we're seeing much of that as they return to school currently. Um, and these are various tools I offer to other professionals, myself I use, and to the teams I use. One of my favorites is an app on your phone where you grow a tree, and if you check your phone, that tree dies. And so you say, okay, I wanna work for half an hour. You put the app on your phone, you put it here, and uh, the tree is growing. So as you try to look at your phone, it says, put it down or that tree is gonna die. And you know, sometimes all it takes is a virtual tree for you to not check your phone. This is an example of gamification done in the favor of the user. And there's a wonderful resource that has a variety of tools where they try to turn the game on the social media giants or on the uh, attention currency seekers who benefit from stealing your attention by giving you tools to control your attention. And we can benefit from this both as educators ourselves and by teaching it to the teens we serve. Um, and they have many, many recommendations on their website. I'll just put up a few. There's some good news. Um, studies prior to the pandemic showed that when students who have been engaging in a lot of screen time, they often lose the ability to, to empathize. They don't know how to read social cues as well. And so they don't engage as well with their peers and which can further lead to isolation and further get them to invest time in social media or in screens because it's a quick escape. So they don't have to feel that distress of isolation. And this cycle was broken by intervention camps where teens couldn't be on their phones and they had to engage in uh, social socialization. And within a week, there was huge improvement. So I am optimistic that as our youth return to school, they will regain their ability to socialize, especially if given the opportunities to do so in a healthy manner. So let me wrap up today's presentation by talking about what else can we do as educators? And let me be honest, we were doing the best we can. This is not to say that you have to be doing more or somehow that your distress and suffering is because you haven't been doing enough. This is more to say, there may be other ideas out there that we can benefit from, given that we are facing a very difficult situation. And I love the concept of resilience, and I'm really glad that uh, Chief Mary Joseph brought it up, because it's something that we can all learn from in terms of how we can navigate chronic distressful situations, chronic situations that cause us anxiety or a complete change in our lifestyle. And I love watching the Paralympics, because to me, that is one of the primary uh, or a, a very beautiful example of uh, resilience, of seeing people who have adapted to dramatic changes in their lives and are still making the best of what they could be doing. So there are many attributes or qualities that can help with fostering resilience. We're gonna to touch upon a few. And the first one I wanna talk about, which Mary Joseph brought up was emotion focused. Uh, sometimes in psychology, we call that naming it to taming. Acknowledging, giving a voice, labeling when we are experiencing something hard, something heavy, and having the language to express that. So brushing things aside or pretending they aren't happening seldom results in good emotional outcomes. When we're experiencing sadness, grief, depression, compassion fatigue, burnout, noticing it and labeling it is one of the most helpful things we could do. It doesn't worsen the condition when we 
pay attention to it and acknowledge its reality, it actually starts the process of healing. Sitting there and saying everything is fine when it's not doesn't do anyone any good. And much of what we've experienced in the last two years can be described by the emotion of grief. We have had a lot of loss and grief is a natural response to loss. Loss of loved ones, loss of normalcy, loss of things we used to enjoy, activities we used to enjoy. And our response to loss, the process of grief can involve many emotions, anger, guilt, sadness, heartbreak. And we may go through these emotions many, many times. It's important to start with validating how we are feeling and giving room to our colleagues to tell us how they're feeling. And I often like to talk to colleagues about burnout and to give voice to it and to talk about it if I'm experiencing it myself because it is okay to talk about heavy and big emotions. Um, that is part of the grieving process, noticing that emotion and staying with it. Resisting our temptation to dismiss hard emotion, to pretend it's not happening to us because we wanna be there for those we love. By dismissing it, we add to its weight. Um, it's also helpful for us as educators to role model how to deal with emotions for our teens. Uh, one of the ways we can do it is by showing them that uh, it's okay to have hard emotions. So if as a teacher, you ever cried in front of your students, that's totally okay. It is okay for them to know it's human to have emotions. And one effective tool for us as educators is to label an emotion, if you're experiencing it, I'm feeling grief, I'm feeling a sadness because I lost a family member. Explain how that emotion makes sense. That's a natural response to loss. Grief or sadness is what happens when we lose something important. And then tell the students how you're coping. I'm coping by reaching out to colleagues and by taking time to think about the legacy of that person who I love. So by doing this, by showing students that we are human, we have emotions, labeling the emotion, saying how it makes sense, and then telling them how you're coping, we teach children a valuable lesson that emotions make sense. They often tell us information about the world and that there are ways of coping with them. So that when they have big emotions, they don't feel lost or out of control. They realize I can also think about ways of coping with this. Meaning and purpose, that's perhaps the most important work that I do with young professionals who are experiencing burnout. Um, one of my favorite psychologists is Viktor Frankl. Aside from being an amazing psychologist uh, who started the existentialist psychology movement, he was also a Holocaust survivor. And my rabbi often tells me this story of how Viktor Frankl lived through probably one of the darkest times of human history. And he noted that many people he interacted with in, in his time as Auschwitz, um, if they had meaning or purpose, they were able to withstand longer the abuses that were thrown at them daily. And that meaning could have been something as simple as wanting to live another day so they may see a loved one in the future, wanting to live another day so they can publish a book they had in their head, or simply wanting to live another day so that they can tell their story afterwards. In other words, in some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering the moment it finds meaning. And we often, all of us, approach this profession because there was meaning in it for us, because it resonated with our values. And values are broad statements that guide our behavior, that may help us understand what's important. So if your value as a person is learning and your value is helping others grow, no wonder you were drawn to education because then teaching was meaningful creating that intimate connection with another consciousness and helping them overcome a challenge was meaningful to you. And oftentimes in the heat of this uncertainty, compassion, fatigue, and burnout, we may lose track of the meaning that draws, that drew us to this profession in the first place. And so I often give professionals that I'm working with who are experiencing burnout an exercise to create a mission statement. And this is something we're gonna ask you to do uh, during the afternoon session. And a, vision, a mission statement talks about your vision, what it is you want to do. It also talks about your values and the meaning you drive from that. And a good way to think of a, a mission statement is think about your first week 
as you start your professional program, as you are that keen, excited student who are starting teacher's college or starting your social work degree or whatever program it is you are in and you're just excited. You are, you, your vision was you were looking forward saying, I'm going to touch so many lives. I'm going to be a role model or I'm going to impact children positively. Your value was, I care about growth. I care about the well-being of children in society because I think they're the future. And helping them gives me meaning. So that could be a mission statement. Oftentimes what helps us remember a mission statement is to recall the most recent or the most meaningful impact we've had as an educator. And that can help us connect with that meaning of why was I doing this to begin with? If you remember one of the questions that one of the colleagues was experiencing very not in earlier slide was asking was, what is the point? And that's a good question because if you don't have an answer to that question, what we do can feel like drudgery. It can feel like suffering. So it is important to answer the question, what is the point? There should be a point. And we can make that clear by embedding that in the meaning we're getting out of our actions and how that resonates with our values. And if you write that down, that is a mission statement. And it's always nice to write it down and put it on your wall. Active coping strategies are when we intentionally try to change our experience. Oftentimes our brain is very attuned to looking for threat, for things that are going wrong. To change that, we have to be intentional. So if as a teacher, you know that connecting with students is something you enjoyed, it gave you meaning. Active coping means savoring and looking for those moments of connection. And when they happen, really focusing on them, really saying, this is something that's important to me. That intentionality in bringing about positive and meaningful experiences is very really important because when we don't have that, we feel the, the automaton mode. We feel like we are going through the motions. We feel like a cog in the machine because we don't feel like we have autonomy and choice. And so we always have autonomy and choice in the attitude and in the interactions we bring to other people. And always a good place to start is to make an intentional choice of what do I want to bring to this interaction? What is valuable to me? So I often do this before a, a therapy session. I take a moment and ask myself, what do I want to bring to this session? I want to deeply experience another person's lived experience. Okay, I'm intentional about it. I'm like, that's what I want. And by announcing that to myself beforehand, when I go into that interaction, I'm looking for it. I, and when it happens, I experience it and I get the positive impact of it because I have done something that is meaningful to me. We often call this dropping the anchor of really sitting and looking for the things that you enjoy of that resonate with your values in these interactions. Our brain often tends to miss it. So one of the exercises I, I do with all the educators I work with and myself when I'm doing online interactions is before the online interaction, because it can feel so distant and so impersonal, is to actually ground myself so that I'm ready for a personal connection. And I do that very simply by doing one minute of breathing. And I know this may sound simple, but something that's looking at this graphic for, and I, I actually do this, this graphic for one minute, and, breathe in it, and then ask myself, what intention do I have for this interaction, for this next moment? Really allows me to not only feel inside my body, and that allows us to feel powerful because we use our bodies to control the environment. So when we are embodied is when we feel most autonomous, when we feel most agent-like. And when I'm in my body and I ask myself, what is my intention? I now enter that interaction with a clear purpose with a clear radar looking for those opportunities that will give me meaning. And that results in compassion satisfaction, which is the counter to compassion fatigue. These are the positive aspects of helping others, the satisfaction and deep fulfillment we can get from touching another person's life. And this is something that our brain may miss even when we are doing it, if you're not intentional. And it's especially easy to miss it when we are at a distance when we don't pick up on those uh, body language cues that we usually would pick up on. Lastly, social support. And this is why this meeting is so wonderful. And I look forward to having other meetings like this because we benefit from being around our colleagues during the lows and the highs. Social support is one of the best buffers against burnout. And uh, I love that many of my teacher colleagues and my psychology and special services colleagues have created informal support groups during the pandemic, whether on a WhatsApp group chat or through Zoom meetings, drop-in sessions. And those communities of learning, communities of our colleagues who informally coalesce and come together is the glue that keeps us together. 
and is what can help us buffer the stress of burnout. Lastly, an internal focus of control. So locus of control means, do we feel like we have power and agency or do we feel like we are victim and things happen to us? And both of them are true. Sometimes we have power and sometimes we are victims of circumstance. However, what we primarily believe really affects how we feel. When we have an external locus of control, we have more anxiety and depression, whether we have autonomy or not in that situation. And enhancing or investing in our belief and our ability that we are agents of change, that we do have some say over our destiny can really buffer the effects of anxiety and depression and help us create a better society. So I encourage many of you, if you feel like the way we have navigated this pandemic so far has room for improvement, then get involved. Let's make it improve. And you can get involved through your school. You can get involved through your community. But let's, by looking for those students who are falling through the cracks, by connecting with other colleagues who are experiencing burnout or who are experiencing distress, and by getting involved politically, by connecting with your MPs and MPPs, and by making sure that we are advocating for the people we care about and that we are active members of our civic society, because that empowers us and that creates an internal locus of control that I'm not just the victim of this circumstance of this pandemic. Yes, the storm is happening, but I choose to go outside and dance in that storm. That is the choice I make despite the circumstances that are happening. So on that note, I wanna thank you for your attention and thank my colleagues, especially Veronica, who really helped me with the setup here. Um, and uh, I turn it back to the committee, the organizing committee, Uh, so thank you. Thank you for uh, your presentation. We really appreciated this. Thank you, Christina. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn it over. We're going to have some questions and answers, if that's okay. Uh, we're going to ask sure. people to uh, either raise their hand. I think the best thing is raise their hand because we can't monitor both the, the chat right now and the um, and the, the hand raising. So we'll take hands at this point in time if people have questions. Um, I see Timothy McGrenery. So if uh, you'd like to ask your question. I, I don't think I was looking to ask a question. I just wanted okay. to, that was terrific. Uh, very thorough. I, I guess the question I would have is, can we share this, uh, your presentation uh, with staff directly? Um, I'm sure they would like to, to see it, uh, everyone. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Timothy. I, I would be delighted. Uh, of course, we are at the whim, in this case, of technology. So let's see if the recording turned out. <laughs> okay, but thank you. Thank you. Just so you're aware, we are recording um, uh, Dr. Shabaloshi's uh, um, uh, presentation. So that will be available to you. And I believe that you are also uh, sharing uh, some of the resources that uh, you've shared with us today as well, so that Absolutely. you can share with our community. So um, any other questions, questions that uh, perhaps have come up? Um, Michael? Hi, thank you for that. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the idea of naming your, um, sorry, I wanna, I wanna put that in there again. Um, naming those emotions or giving staff or people the chance to articulate that. Have you seen or could you suggest um, structures that allow that in like, for, say for instance, like a staff, right? Like a large staff. It, are, have you seen uh, mechanisms that work to allow that to happen? Like I'm, I'm, I think that's fascinating because I think a lot of people are um, frustrated or they're, they're, you know, you ask, how's it going? And they don't even know how to answer that question anymore. Right? <laughs> I mean, before it was just a question we would ask yeah. as an intro, but now people are like, I don't know. Um, have you seen like what, what, what structures exist or that you could suggest that we could possibly I enact? Michael, that's a wonderful question. And, and there are many levels of answer to that question. Um, let me start with the, with the structure I've seen work the, 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 the best recently, but it's not the, the most effective structure. And those are informal groups. And so, um, uh, for example, I recently had a group of psychologists and we had a session called Wine and Wine, where you drink wine and you whine about how rough things are going. Now, these informal groups are wonderful because um, they allow us to be unfiltered. They allow us to really 
talk about the heavy things that are happening to us without the worry that's going to impact either a professional standing judgment of others of us or or the people we care about because <laughs> sometimes we don't want them to hear how rough we are having it um so the informal groups are effective they're not the the most um the solution I would go for because that they put the onus on the professionals. Um, we typically need a system response. Now, I know that we have the employee and family assistance program, and that can be a good start. However, oftentimes we like to open up to people we feel connected to. It's hard to do it with a stranger, which is why going to therapy, for example, is a very courageous act. When people come to me and talk to me about you know, their deepest hurts, I, I am always impressed with their courage because I'm like, this is tough. You don't know me and you're opening up to me. That is scary. So informal groups to begin with, I think where there's a lot of opportunity for growth is when we have cultures, cultures of uh, emotion, uh, uh, what we call emotion coaching or emotion informed environments. And that culture is often set by the leadership. So whether it's at, at the system as a whole or in a school set where we create the room um, literal room and time and space to talk about, these are the challenges I'm facing. And sometimes it really does take those in a position of leadership to become vulnerable. Because when uh, it's hard for people to become vulnerable to begin with, it's scary. And it's even scary to do it in a professional setting. And to do that while you have any level of hierarchy, any person that you perceive to be in an authority position above you, it's frightening. So a good place to start is to invite people in positions of authority, either perceived or actual. Um, so that could be more senior colleagues or colleagues who are, for example, in admin roles to, to start or to create these spaces and to take the risk of themselves becoming vulnerable, of sharing the story of a hardship or of, of a challenge they navigated, whether personal or professional. And, and that can set, set the cultural tone of the work environment as that this is an environment where we condone, where we uh, tolerate, not even tolerate, where we invite uh, us to be open and vulnerable. That, of course, is hard to create uh, and sometimes takes time and active involvement of every level of leadership. And I have seen it in many of the schools I'm at. So I, I, I am very uh, optimistic and impressed that this is happening across the board. And of course, we have room to improve. Um, does that answer your question, Michael? Let me turn it back to you. Um, it, it does. It leads to other questions about, you know, how to do that. But I, I, the idea of being open to it and being um, uh, ha having a space to allow that to occur is an interesting one for sure. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you for that. That's great. That's awesome. Amazing. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Yeah, Jennifer, I'll just uh, some very positive comments uh, in our chat as well. Thank you, colleagues. And I'll make sure that the slides and the presentation are shared. Um, I will put up a link once we have everything uploaded and, and ready for you to access. And, and please feel free to share it with your school communities. So we appreciate that. Um, wanted just to um, thank you um, again. <laughs>